Well, good morning and welcome to you. Gosh, we have a great one here for you to kick off our Friday. Now, we've been here all this week, so if you missed any, check out my Self Recruiter YouTube channel or easily uh, available also over on my Facebook, also my LinkedIn Live, but easiest is probably the YouTube channel. Monday, we began with supercharging your job search, all the ways to really energize and organize and manage and control your job search. Goal really is to get you to a place where you're able to receive multiple offers. That's the only way you really receive choice in your job search. Tuesday, we did resume renovation, all the secrets really to make your resume be the standout. Get them in here, get them on the phone. I have to speak with them. That's the job of the resume, by the way. Wednesday, we did LinkedIn, all the ways to take that single sheet resume with the essence and value of your career, transforming it into a three-dimensional sales brochure over onto the LinkedIn side. Yesterday, Thursday, we had a special part two to my LinkedIn called Career Evolution. That's once I have this fantastic LinkedIn profile, now what do I do with it? That's how to build and manage your own digital self-marketing campaign for your career in just two minutes per day. Today, we finish out the week with interview intervention, all the things that must have to happen before we do our next interview because somebody really has to stop us. The job on the interview is to teach them how to select you. We're going to go into all of that today. We'll be back for one more session on Monday, a very special one at 11 a.m. on Monday, which will be my live Ask Self Recruiter live Q&A. If you're not getting your questions answered on your job search, resume, LinkedIn, whatever it may be, negotiations, whatever, send them in to ask at selfrecruiter.com. That's ask at selfrecruiter.com. All the best ones are always included. Now, let's kick off today. We have a lot of content to share with you. Uh, I guess I should have pulled up the recap <laughs> while I was telling you, as you're going to see here in just a moment. Here's the whole week's schedule. Uh, I'll trust that you can start and stop your video if you'd like to take a closer look at that. We're going to move right on ahead. So, uh, <clears throat> and of course, Monday, don't forget to come back on Halloween. Yep, I will be here on Halloween. Very special 11 a.m. for the Ask Self Recruiter live Q&A. Come back. That's a really terrific one. I think that will be about the 20th episode all over on the LinkedIn side. Oh, we're going to skip that part. You can check out my website on your own and we're going to get right into interview intervention. Now, when I when I named this lecture, I thought about the challenge and most people, this is what they need. They need an intervention before their next interview. They seem to go into the interview and just answer questions, question, answer, question, answer, like it's an interrogation. I know it can feel like an interrogation, <laughs> but it's a sales meeting. So that's what we really have to understand that it's a sales meeting. And now, of course, things are more complicated because we're in a pandemic world and we have to think about how that factors into things. Mostly a lot more video interviewing is in the process. Throughout everything in the interview process, whatever it constitutes for you, whether that starts with a pre-screening phone call, moves on to a video chat, maybe it even moves on to a, a, a large uh, six or eight panel interview over video. All of that might even happen before in person. It's all about that influence ability that you have and the nuance in communications that you can essentially juggle. Your interview is part of your personal branding. When you walk in the door, whether that's physically or, or into an electronic meeting like this one, how you present yourself matters. I, I was out earlier doing cardio along the uh, waterfront here in New York City. And, and you know, of course, I've got uh, uh, tights on, five finger shoes, you know, athletic shirt. I'm out there. If I show up here looking like that, I don't think you're really going to take my advice. You have to look the part. That's part of your personal branding as well. So think about um, you may have gotten to a relaxed state working from home. Oh, I don't need to be so fancy, so dressed up. And don't I understand that? But the interview is part of your personal brand on display. And so even the visual is incredibly important. We are this product, as we've talked about all week long. Whether we enjoy this part or this realization or not, if we understand more product, we have to think about how that product is packaged, how it's dressed up, how is the staging set, how is the lighting for that product, uh, is the positioning on the shelf, the good positioning, all those things that can really separate us from the other people. 
That's all part of our brand. Then we have to make sure to carry it across all of our marketing materials, but then we have to take it right into our communications and right into our interview itself. Now, in terms of interview, your success level is determined by how much preparation you put in. Interviews are a sales meeting. Ooh, sales meeting? I thought they were just gonna talk to me and ask me questions. It's a sales meeting and you're there to take back control. You're there not to be the bull in the China shop. I'll let them feel in control. Of course, of course. But you're supposed to run the meeting even if you let them feel like they're running the meeting. It's your job to make your case for why you're the very best one that they'll choose today. Shouldn't be an interrogation. Quite simply, this is our job. It's our job to teach them how to select us as the very best individual. And that, that requires some very, very good discussion. Of course, we've talked about this a lot this week in the various lectures. This is, is, is both the challenge and the solution for most people. Uh, the, the failure part that people make, and you may carry that into interview, you have to be careful, is they try to be too cookie cutter perfect. Oh, you know, I'll be cookie, I'll be cookie cutter perfect. I can get right in this line, I, right up here. Cookie cutter perfect. That's great. I'll take number two. Number two, I'm going to pay you less. No, 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 you don't want less. Number three, I'll take, take you with less. No, number five, less. I'm paying less. If you're all cookie cutter interchangeable, I'm paying the lowest price I can pay. doesn't really matter who. So even in interview, yes, we have to convey, well, I am cookie cutter perfect, but I'm so much more. So what are you going to do to demonstrate your exceptionalism? If you haven't seen me before, John Krant, author, career coach, and speaker. Resume and LinkedIn guru as well. So if your career is, is suffering from lack of opportunity, that should be there for you. If doors are not opening for you, that's really something wrong with the storytelling across your resume, across your LinkedIn profile. Um, if you'd like to work together, all my services tabs or over all my services are under my services tab over on the self recruiter website. And if you need to talk before you know, which package is really the right one for you, send me a quick email and we will talk. Now, as we move a little bit further ahead, a couple of the resources, my books are great resources, good roadmap for everything that happens in job search, LinkedIn, resume, negotiating, all of that. You can also watch a very special version of my LinkedIn lecture. Now, there's the one I did, of course, on Wednesday, but there's a very special version right on my self recruiter website halfway down the page. And in that version, you can see me large, see the slides large. You can really use it as a wonderful start and stop tutorial as you build out a better profile. Also on my LinkedIn, as you see here, you can get to some of my articles that will help you really supercharge your job search or how your resume doesn't become resume roadkill, all those other things. Let's get to self recruiter and the umbrella for today. This covers the entire lecture series and, and today we'll turn this self recruiter lens toward interviewing, but really becoming a self recruiter is becoming one great recruiter looking after one truly exceptional candidate, which is also you. But that means we're going to have to also be the strategist, the planner, uh, the cheerleader, going to have to pick ourselves up at the bootstrap sometimes. So besides all of that networking and managing process of becoming your self recruiter also involves keeping one eye on the toughest competitor imaginable. Those four or five, six people that would just, <laughs> they're going after the job. Oh, forget it, forget it. We can beat those people very, very easily. Uh, they don't really prepare. They suffer from ego and arrogance. Oh, who are they going to hire? They're going to hire me. And then they don't prepare. Getting dressed, a little splashing of water on the face, that's not preparing. So a little bit of thought, a little bit of strategy, you can outmaneuver them very, very quickly. We'd all like to go after the job, get the interview, and just it, it all just goes so rosy for us. But, you know, it doesn't typically work that way. Most people are sitting home hitting that darn button over and over as fast as they can. It usually says submit to train us to be submissive. It leaves us in a very unhappy place. I'm perfect. Why didn't they call me? Did you send it to the decision maker or did you send it to someone not qualified to review your background? I'll let you decide who that might be. We have to think in terms of unusual, unconventional, unexpected. And when we walk into the interview, the same situation, we're going to simply change this equation of diminishing returns by changing the rules. It's uh, who said I have to answer 20 questions, 20 answers. Eh, that may be their style from lack of experience, but I can answer back conversationally. I can draw them into the discussion. I can understand how to stroke their ego and I can never forget 
that the entire meeting is also a date. This is a date to see if we're right. Now, in terms of this product, they may want this product that you offer, uh, but there's only two reasons they're really ever going to hire you. And that has to factor into your preparation for interviews. Yes, you have to be capable and qualified, but but I'm not I'm not going to hire you because you're capable and qualified. Please, please don't mishear that. <laughs> I would not hire anybody I did not think was capable or qualified. But I, I, that's not the criteria for hiring. That's like the minimal foundational piece that isn't even on my radar. No one gets gets past the threshold without that. So that's not really the decision piece. The decision for me and almost every decider who has the right chemistry, who has the best chemistry, because they're already capable and qualified. Who has the best chemistry? And who do I have confidence in? Chemistry number one, confidence in number two. Where does the confidence come from? The ease and elegance of you being able to tell your story, overcome the objections, problem solve, engage, because it's a date. Now, going into the interview, here's the biggest little tip I can give you, and that is don't be mediocre. You know, about half the workforce falls into this category, really kind of just showing up for the paycheck of only moderate quality, not very good, ordinary, average, middling, middle of the road, undistinguished, uh, uninspired, indifferent, unexceptional, unremarkable. Uh, if I could read this, it's a little smaller. <laughs> Amateur, okay, so so, come see, come saw, plain vanilla, sort of middling, no great shakes, not up to much, and bush league. I know that's not a very happy thing, but there's silver lining there. Do you realize if half the workforce is mediocre, what do you, what do you have to be? Little tiny bit better than mediocre. And suddenly you can be everything they're looking for. So if I wanted to really, really be everything that they look for, all I'd have to do is really put a little heart and soul into it. Simply a little heart and soul into every job that you do you rise to be the top one, two, three percent. So getting ready for interview, we have to prepare our story. We have to be ready to tell it. We have to be ready to tell it in an organic way, as if we were talking to a dear old friend we hadn't seen in about five years. Warm relationship. They already like me and, and I can look back and tell a story with rose colored glasses. Now, your interview may be uh, in person, maybe over the telephone. Uh, most, most likely these days it's going to be Zoom or Meet or one of those technologies as, as part of the process, you have to prepare for everything that comes up. First thing is don't follow the instructions. It's a sales meeting. You run the meeting without being the bull in the China shop. Um, so I decide as I go into my own interview, I decide what happens really based on how I carry myself. So I'm not really there to answer questions. Oh, I might answer a few just so I don't throw them off their style but I'm going to work to bring it over to conversational style very, very quickly because I am there to persuade them. So yeah, I'm just using the device or the framework of the Q&A to really present and sell and position. And that means I've got to think like a politician. Now, I hate to talk politics these days because of everything that's going out there, but a good politician, I don't mean someone that produces a good outcome, <laughs> a good politician is a person that knows when not to answer a question. And so you may hear a question and you may have to rephrase that question. You may not want to answer it the way it was. One of the best examples I've seen of this, and <clears throat> anybody really high level in, in most significant roles can already do this. But if you look back at Tim Cook, Tim Cook, who's running Apple, if we look back, oh, I think it's four or five springs ago, he was giving a talk to a university audience. This was not a commencement, so it's not one of those speeches, but he was just giving a talk to a university class. And of course they all have their iPhones out and Androids and whatever, taking, taking photos. And uh, somebody asked him a very inappropriate question. W when is it okay not to listen to our professors? <laughs> Thank you for that lovely, oh, your students are so, hmm. <laughs> what a lovely question. Uh, now, Tim's a pretty smart guy and instantly he rephrased the question. I said, well, I, I think what you're really asking me is when is it okay not to follow the rules? I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I think you should rarely follow the rules. I think you should be writing the rules if you'd like to get to where you're dreaming about. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but you can go back and you can see that video. 
And that's the point. You're going to have to say, you know, I think what you mean, or I think what you're looking for, and, and you're going to have to paint toward what you have pre-decided you need to tell them because this is a sales meeting. A salesperson does not getting get tricked into saying something that doesn't help the sale. You're, you're need, needing to do the same thing. Yet we still have to be honest. We still have to be genuine. So sometimes we do answer the question we wish we were asked. Now, also, we have to prepare for why you're more valuable because if they're going to select you, it's going to be because you're more valuable than five or six competitors. So let's begin to make a list of why, you know, we could be the standout, what makes it different. But we can't lose sight of the fact that it's really, if we're all more or less equal, absolutely it's down to chemistry and confidence. So I have to do overtime on this. That's how I create the engagement, which is a whole, whole lot closer to this style engagement than the mechanical style engagement. So that goes back to our story, how it's going to connect to people, how I can think like a storyteller that can tell something that's still very true, yet interesting. I could tell you the same story in a dull, blah, 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 or I could tell, oh my gosh, and then the door opened and this happened next. I'll tell you the same story two different ways. So when you think back to what parts of your background you're going to engage in telling story during interview, you have to think about, yes, satisfying the capable and qualified, but also I have to bring in the interesting and what makes me tick piece, whether that is connected to my work professional life or whether that's outside of my work professional life, because those are the reasons they're ultimately going to get me in addition to being qualified and capable. This requires a paradigm shift, a total metamorphosis in our approach to interviewing. I'm not here to answer questions. I'm here to tell you a great story. So as if you've done the work that we worked on all week with the resume and, and your LinkedIn, and you worked through all your background information material, you probably heard this part already. Otherwise, you probably need to do a deep dive interview of yourself before the interview, capture all the information, and then sift it through this singular lens. What part of that storytelling background individual pieces rises to the level to help persuade an individual that if they hire this person, best business decision they're gonna to make today. So then you know which items to talk about and which items to begin to practice that storytelling that can not only communicate that I'm capable and qualified, uh, but I'm also somehow special, different, exceptional. And that's all those soft skills we use to convey that. Those soft skills are the emotional intelligence quotient. I'm not going to read everything that's coming up on screen here, but you can see what it is. I like really this, this last piece, this friendliness and optimism. You know, I'm as, about as optimistic as you get. I'm a Sagittarius. So um, the sun will come up tomorrow, even if it's a nuclear holocaust. And I sure hope it isn't, but but the sun's coming up tomorrow no matter what. So that friendliness and optimism will work towards you. But every single bit of your soft skill, that nuance of building communication is how you're going to win them over. Influence, influence. Get them to see you as the person. Now, before I walk into that interview or tune in if it's on Zoom or pick up the phone if it's, it's uh, if it's on old-fashioned telephone, I want to warm up that audience. I want to get them reading about my background ahead of the conversation. You know, we have a we have a, a, a strangeness with how we parse information. If if I were to tell you something, you first evaluate whether or not you should believe it, and then you believe it or don't believe it. If you read the exact same thing, you tend to believe it because you have no credibility issue with yourself. You read it. It was in print. You just accept it as fact. Now, that that portends some awful things for our future. <laughs> if you'd like to see that as a better example, go back and watch the movie from, oh, I think it was from somewhere in the 1980s. Could have been maybe late 80s called Tucker, The Man and His Dream, with Jeff Bridges. And it's about this guy that wants to build, uh, leave one of the big automakers and build a better car. So he gets his buddies who also want to build a better car to, to leave their jobs and they pool their money and they design this fabulous better car. And they have a line on where they can lease the manufacturing facility, where they can get the steel and everything else. And behind the scenes, the oh, the big three are all working to kill this deal, kill this off. And, and it's all falling apart. And, and because... Every time, you know, their plan is to sell franchise dealerships and from the franchise dealerships, then we can secure the lease and get the steel and 
start checking it in, get the whole process. But every time they're like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm so I'm ready to sign, ready to sign. <gasps> when do I get to see the car? When do I get to see the car? What car? There is no car, <laughs> you know, chicken or the egg. So they're like, if I can't sell the dealerships, I can't get this forward. And they're, we may have to go back and work for the man again type thing in the movie. And so they pull their last little bit of money and they buy a two page spread in the newspaper. And I saw lots of these growing up in the 1970s. It's this beautiful two page spread, nothing more than a drawing of this fabulous car, the sun all around, the family just fawning over the car. The phone is ringing off the hook to buy dealerships. That car is no more real today than yesterday, but that's the difference in how we parse information. So with this technique here, before the interview, I'm going to go into LinkedIn. I'm going to open up every single person's profile that I'm about to meet. That triggers a marketing event as having looked at them. Hi, here's my title. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to ask them to connect with them. That's a second opportunity basically for them to go, hmm, who's this person? And in asking them to connect, I'm going to remind them that I'm about to meet them at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. Because I'd like to do it a day or two ahead so they have time to look. It's a sales process. Each of these outreaches, each of these figurative little nudges are a chance for them to look over my shoulder and read all about my background. And they have no credibility issue with reading themselves and they tend to believe what's there don't use that to misrepresent but do use it to properly convey and etch your value into their heads so i'm going to along with that asking them to connect i'm going to send them a little message that says you don't know me i'm professionally appropriate give them a little stroke to the ego uh and of course looking forward to meeting you on tuesday and i'd love to add you to my professional network on linkedin now many people may not accept that until after you show up on tuesday it's not emotional this is simply to get them to look at you, get them to look at you as many times as possible before Tuesday. Now, a follow-up to this is, of course, Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning, whatever I need to do. If I have a 10 a.m. meeting, I'm now going to email each person individually again. Looking forward to our discussion at 10 a.m. Of course, I want this to be easy and be at the top of your inbox. Looking forward to a great discussion. I didn't even mention what was there, but of course, my resume link to my LinkedIn profile. If I have other materials I had to send them, it's all included, but I never listed it out. And again, they'll look at that before the meeting. They'll now have had multiple times to look at and believe in your value before you walk into that meeting. And that will change the discussion in that meeting. The whole goal is to get them over to your LinkedIn where you can sell them about why you're the, the right choice. Small changes change perception. If you haven't increased the value of your LinkedIn, make sure to check out this past Wednesday's lecture or the lecture that's right on my self recruiter website. Be persuasive and change some minds. Now let's get over to actually creating an interview plan. We're going to go back to each one of these sectors and do a deep dive drill. So don't be shocked at how quickly we move here. We're going to build your agenda. It's a sales meeting. We're going to do a needs analysis. It's a sales meeting. We're going to select the work life stories that we're going to talk about because it's a sales meeting we have to prepare for. When there's no buy sign, we have to figure out what's missing. Like a detective, we have to overcome those objections and we have to close them, which is just a scary sales term about getting them to think of us as the very right choice. So let's drill down here and show you how you build out the full interview plan. Let's take the first part, building your agenda. Well, who are you about to meet? I have to have every single person's vote, not just the decider. That's one person. I need every person's vote. If I get more votes from everybody than the competitors get, I'm ahead of everybody else. So who am I meeting? Each one may require a different approach and discussion to build the chemistry with this person or to build the chemistry with that person. How are you going to build chemistry with each of these people? You have to think about that in advance. How are our backgrounds similar? Where have we have done similar things? What experiences could we share? All important in building chemistry. What career stories should you tell this one? Or, oh, this one wants to hear that career story. Work through your agenda. Is there something you could tell them that would make them jump out of their chair? There must be something else they need to hear. That's all in the building the agenda piece. Then we have to do a needs analysis. Now, <clears throat> needs analysis, scary sales term, simply means why don't you not answer too many questions until you ask, actually reconfirm 
that the need you're believing they have is actually the real one. A lot of people will read the job posting, go in and interview right for that job that they read about, and then they're not right for the job because that job posting is not right. But, but this is what you said you wanted. But I didn't know how to write it. <laughs> so you have to go in and redefine whether you what you think is what they want is what they really do want. So we have to do a needs analysis. And that is, you know, of course, Jack, Jim or Jill, because you can't let them think you didn't prepare. I've done my homework. I've read the background information, of course, read the job posting. And a little bit of stroke to the ego, but I'd love to hear from your perspective. I'd love to your advice. You know, as I would step into this role, yes, I begin to visually and verbally project myself into the role. As I would step into this role, from your view, what do you see as the two or three most critical components to get control of in the first, say, 30 to 60 days? By the way, stay away from 90 days. That triggers something completely different, the 90-day probationary period that is provided for by law. Ignore that. Don't hit 90 days. Triggers that. 30 to 60 days will cause them to think of what's on fire, what's about to start on fire, what has derailed, what's about to derail. Um, so if let's see what you get from that, but you can drill down when you either get or don't get enough detail and go, well, tell me about some of the pain issues you'd like to change or what else would you like to see change or what would you like to see solved? Um, also pursue why the job is open. Three basic reasons the job is open. This might be an expansion, which is great. I, oh, I love expansion. New opportunity. What does that mean? That means I might have to wear a lot of hats doing a lot of things that I had support people to do in the other jobs. Are you ready for that? If that's you, maybe this is a great one for you. If you require all this support accoutrement around your job, maybe that initial expansion job isn't the right one for you. Maybe the person got promoted. Maybe that's what happened. Promoted, promoted. What do you think their work product is? The state of the work product they left behind if they were promoted? Oh, probably pretty good, but that's probably why they're promoted. They'd probably also like that momentum to continue to move forward positively. So you have a little bit of idea. Now, now, what if they left on their own or were fired? Kind of like two halves of the same thing. But what if they left on their own? Have you have you ever left a job on your own? Like for a new job? I got a new job. I have to leave. Let me ask you a question. When did you start looking for that new job? Or I could ask you a different question. When did you stop doing your job? <laughs> because most of us start looking for the new job four, five, six months before we leave the job. And somewhere along that journey, many people kind of go into coasting mode where I don't recommend it, but they go into coasting mode where they suddenly have stopped doing their job and they, uh, and then the boss may not even realize it. If the person has left on their own, there could be a derailment about to happen that they're even unaware of. Maybe in that case, you have to go, what are the two most critical projects in motion right now? The ones that may be in danger. Uh, what have you not seen? That's quite interesting. It may seem like just a simple innocuous question, but that's the one that will tell you what they have, the reason why they've not hired. Whatever they tell you they've not seen, if you have that, boy, I'd usher it right. Well, in fact, I've done that at my last three employers and talked to them about it. So that's the needs analysis. Before you answer questions, just make sure you understand what the target really is, what they'd like to hear. Now we have to select our work life customize and customize those stories because we have, we now understand the target. We understand what they're looking for. What would they like to hear? Which stories of my background do I have to bring to the forefront to kind of win their, their, their vote, their interest? That's the work life stories and be ready for those. Key to that, by the way, is to write out those stories exactly how you might say it. Now, if you write them out like you might write them out in a book, it's not really going to work. I don't want you to murder the language, but we do have to speak in the way people speak, and we do not speak the way we write. It's often an incomplete sentence structure, tangential ideas here and there we may or may not come back to. You know, let's not get too out of hand, but you have to be organic. So. I always recommend you write out that whatever you intend to say as if you're talking to a dear old friend you haven't seen in five years and then practice it out loud until it gets very comfortable and organic. Overcoming objections. Well, that's actually quite easy. 
Um, overcoming any objection. Well, first off, why would they object? It's their job <laughs> and it's how they test us. They object to us because they'd like to see how we put our thoughts together. They'd like to evaluate. Oh, I love that answer. <laughs> if we had a person like this on our team, we wouldn't be having the issues we have now. That's why they object to us. But no matter what objection they give us, it might sound like it's the end of the road. Well, John, you haven't worked in our industry. Doesn't sound like it could get much worse, much worse than that, does it? You know, I haven't. <laughs> Just like it's a gift from you know who. Look, if I haven't worked in the industry, I cannot fudge that. The only way to address that is to agree, but then disagree. So the technique here is agree, but disagree. Now, in some way, shape, or form, I'm going to get as close to agreement without damaging myself as possible. Then I'm going to disagree with it by what I say next. Well, you haven't worked in our industry. You know, I haven't. <laughs> but, you know, Jack, Jim, or Jill, I'm sure you'll meet lots of those individuals or those candidates. Other people are candidates. We are an individual. I mean, I'm sure you'll meet lots of other candidates that have that background with all the people, uh, you know, from the normal sources in the industry. What I bring is something very, very different as an individual. And it's why it would be most successful in this role. Could be because your job is to sell and persuade. Well, you haven't worked since last year. You know, I haven't, but you know, um, I have to say, you know, when, when I left my last organization, I hadn't had a career break in quite some time. So, you know, all those projects that, that build up at home and everything else, I worked my way all the way through, through those, had a little bit of career break, but I am so excited to get my career back on track. Yes. People will even like that. They might, we want to know like, were you sitting home with your feet up having bonbons? No working on all those projects. But now my focus is clear, ready to get back on track. Whatever it might be, you have more nonprofit, you have more commercial, same kind of thing. They have lots of people in commercial, in commercial. They have lots of people in nonprofit, in nonprofit. What they don't have is the opposite to round out the thought process. You have to position why that's a sell piece, an advantage piece for them. If there's no buy sign, well, what is a buy sign in an interview? There's only two of them. First buy sign is any indication that you are moving to the next level. Not that there is a next level. <laughs> of course, there's a next level. Am I moving there? There's an indication of a buy sign. Oh, love to bring you back next week to meet Jack, Jim, or Jill. Fantastic. By the way, they do not have to schedule it yet. They've already told you, indicated, yes, I'm going to bring you back for this. Only other type of buy sign is either offer or moving toward offer. And mostly that's as simple as, oh, I'd love to get your, your references. I'd like to move toward offer. I'd love the sound of that. Okay. Anything else that sounds like this? Oh my gosh, what a phenomenal discussion. You bring such an amazing background. You could be truly amazing in this role. <gasps> I don't care how rosy it sounds. If they then segue over to... You know, but we have a few more people to see. It'll probably be a few more weeks before decision. I mean, we'll probably have the person on by the end of the year. <sighs> okay. No buy sign in that case. No matter how rosy they spoke of you. So then what we do is we help them use closing questions, which is a sales technique, to help them visualize in a two-dimensional way a timeline of the whole decision process, kind of like a race, which will cause them to think of where we are on the timeline and what's wrong with us i know i know nobody wants to know what's wrong with us but if they're not buying i'd like them to tell me what's wrong now as an objection so i can overcome it <laughs> i can't be afraid to get in there and duke it out to get the job if i'm right for the job so these closing questions will help you get this job first one is jack what have you not heard or what have we not discussed i tend to go positive negative on the energy there because you never quite know how people's brains are wired, give it to them both ways, that will help you in your decision process for this role or this position, whatever it might be. That's pretty good, by the way. If you've seen me before, you know that's never quite good enough for me. I'd like it a little bit further than that. That is very, very effective. They'll think of the two-dimensional decision process. They'll think of where you are. They'll begin to think of what's wrong with you. And they'll either tell you or not tell you. Next one, a little bit more amperage here. Jack, what have you not heard or, or what have we not discussed that would help you in your selection of me as the very best individual for this role? And then you try to look at them 
without blinking, which hurts <laughs> as long as as long as you possibly can. Do whatever you can there. Sorry for those little sound effects. <laughs> so just to recap this piece of it, we're going to build out the agenda because it's a sales meeting. We're going to do the needs analysis just like a traditional sales meeting. We're going to pre-select our work life stories and flush them out and practice them so we can be organic and off the cuff. When there's no buy sign, we're not going to freak out. We're going to realize that that's the next step is to persuade them to think of you as really the right one. And if they have some objection that's lingering in there to talk to you about it while you're still there and can overcome it and you can either get the job or get the next interview. That's the basics. Let's take you through interview prep in a slightly different way. This is the interview uh, uh, checklist, self-recruiter interview checklist. We're going to cover everything the same field, but in a slightly different way. So I want you to think about the research piece you have to do. We have to research the job itself, the company, the company culture. Of course, the job, you know, if you think you're right for this job, why don't you put down that job ad? Why don't you take out a blank sheet of paper and why don't you write the job description as you see it? How do you think that job should be if you're right for this job? Now, go back and add a few little details maybe off of their job posting and, and maybe some other perspective you might get from other places. Oh, where can I get that? I could go to LinkedIn. And if my network is large enough, do you realize I could pull everybody that's ever held this job before for this company and read about, well, how do they, how do they talk about that job? But I was really thinking like a little bit of a Sherlock Holmes, a little bit of a detective. You realize I could go to all their competitor companies, pull the people doing the same job at the competitor anywhere in the country. It's for preparation. It doesn't matter. Uh, well, how do the people at the competitor talk about the job? You combine the people that have held the job with the people at the competitor and your own background, you'd be transformed in your ability to walk into that conversation and hold it together. That's proper research about the job. The company, same thing. Let's go read every word on the website. Well, what, what, what? You know how big that job, that website is, John? Would you like this job? Yes, go and read every word on the website. I know a lot of it's repetitive sometimes and not very interesting, but what I need to learn how to do, if I don't know how to do it already, is copy and paste. And as I'm reading their website, I need to collect language phrases about how they speak about themselves, collect them into a text document. So you now have phraseology they typically use that you can begin to integrate into your own style as you interview. So they go, I don't know, but John just seems to fit somehow because I'm speaking like one of your employees. A little bit of morphing into their employees through company research. Also check out the various internet research from the financial tools. Check out hoovers.com, the free version or Yahoo Finance, uh, those kinds of things. They have a usually a pretty succinct listing on the companies, even who their direct competitors are pretty quickly. Company culture, you may not even figure that out until you're actually there. Uh, that one's a very, very difficult one. Needs analysis, we talked about it. Just make sure not to answer questions until you do the needs analysis. If you stumble into the meeting and they suddenly go, John, tell me about yourself. I want it to do the needs analysis before they ask me a question. So I go, oh, I'd love to agree, but disagree. Oh, I'd love to. I can't wait before I do. I'd love to make sure my answers are as focused as valuable for you. Of course, I've done my research, but and you go in and do the needs analysis piece, then answer the question. Needs analysis, incredibly important. Oh, behave, your body language is important as well. So let's just remember things like eye contact, but not too much eye contact. You occasionally have to look away to think, even if you don't need to, you know, because if you become one of those statues that moves around the room and the eyes never come off the subject, that's a little creepy and security. Get this guy off my Zoom. <laughs> Maybe I should disconnect. Um, so watch the body language. Also watch the sweaty palms and all that kind of stuff, but no, like, Wiping off to just keep light touch so it's light and dry. Body language. Let's keep that in check. Dress like you're a success. I don't care what you can wear during your typical work day. This is that one day a year where the board of directors are there, the most important clients in, in the office. Uh, uh, the, the CEO is going to have a personal meeting with you or something. So you look need to look like a million bucks. By the way, 
even if they told you not to dress in advance, then you show up all dressed. Oh, oh, oh d didn't you realize you didn't have to dress for this? You know, I have a meeting after this one, so I thought I would come dressed. Meeting after this one? Well, I wonder whether, who's that with? A competitor. <laughs> so even if I didn't have a meeting after, my meeting after would be with my tuna fish sandwich in my nice suit. But I create urgency. You walk in and your competitor is better dressed than you are, presents better than you are, your competitor is ahead of you. Don't lose it over something as silly as that. When you get the job, wear whatever's appropriate. Giving you so much to think about, you'll forget to actually listen. Your job is to really listen not only to the words, but what's between the words, what's, what's not said when these words are being said. Listening is very, very important. You're there to sell yourself. Now, I am there to evaluate, but I'm there to sell, sell, sell. So if you fall in love with me, you make an offer to me. The worst thing that could happen is to go in being skeptical. Hmm, now, now what's your team up to? No, how about this? And then somewhere along the way, you fall in love with them. And then by the end of it, they don't offer you the job. And I've seen that happen as a recruiter when the candidate was a little coy about not being all in. You're there to sell yourself and get that offer, then decide if it's the right one for you. Very easy to turn it down professionally if it's not right for you. Would you like more money? <laughs> sure, I get this part. Everyone would like more money. There's there's no there's no problem with wanting more money. You're not going to like the answer though. Don't talk about money. This is how you get the very best offer. And my clients are the first ones to go, but, but, but when do I wait, wait, wait. Don't talk about money. But, 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 but. There is no blah, 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 blah. Your job is to not talk about money until the absolute last possible moment. Their job is to try to talk about money the absolute first possible moment. Why? Because you feel at a disadvantage. You feel like, oh, if I don't tell them a reasonable enough number, they won't think of me. They won't consider me. Problem is, if you give them a number too early, that number is very, very difficult to change. If you can avoid giving them the number early, then every single subsequent conversation can etch in your value. Now, I had a client a few years back that this is a big, big institution in town. They went through three or four one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews. Then they did, they did a six-panel interview. Then they did a, oh, come on up and have an off-site coffee. That's another interview. And then we think we're getting the call and they're like, oh, we're having an open house on Saturday. <laughs> You, you want to come work the open house like all day Saturday? Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> or you're not going to get the job. So we did. And then we finally got the call and, and, and the manager's like, oh, you, you're not in the system. <sighs> Brilliance. Of course, we never applied for that job. We, we went right to the decision maker and, and, and went right through the process. I should also add that my client is English as a second language, which means... You know, it's not as easy as for them as it might be for others. And yet they had those feelers out there where they even sensed question on money's coming. Let me introduce a question that's so engaging, hijacks your brain, turns the corner, and you forget to ask me about money one more time. Ultimately, you need to avoid any discussion of money to the very, very end. But most people will get trapped. So what happens when we do get trapped and they go, oh, what do you need financially, John? What are you looking for financially? Oh. I got trapped already first round. Um, so if this happens, you, you simply cannot, in my view, cannot ever give them a number. Giving them a number is telling them how little to pay you. It's their job to tell you a number that you can react to. So how I get out of that dance is to simply go, oh my, I, you know, I haven't really thought of it. Um, you know, what today is about for me is about finding the right home for my career that, which is why I'm so excited about this role. Home for your career. Magical phrase. Learn it. Now, surprising that little deflection will cut off a third of the people that will not have the stones to ask you again, which is shocking to me. <laughs> Two thirds coming right back at you, right back at you. Probably trying a helpful technique at first. Oh, I, I, I just need an idea. I mean, I won't hold it against you. Uh, you know, maybe you need some help with that pencil. I'll come around to your side of the desk to help you with those figures. Just need a ballpark. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Um, they're going to use that against you. So, so there's really no time I can tell them. So the second time around, I'm simply going to say, um, all I can tell you is, is, is make me a fair offer. Pause. 
Wouldn't you like a fair offer? Now, what does a fair offer mean to you? What do you think a fair offer means to that decision maker? Something very, very different. So fair offer by itself is a problem that we have to fix through definition. So when I suddenly go, again, I haven't really thought about, oh, just make me a fair offer. There's the solution. I have to give that a beat of time to like resonate. And then I have to define it to make sure we're on the same plane of existence based, of course, on the responsibilities for that role. Is that all you'd like? <laughs> That's the first foundational piece. Another long pause. And, and of course, even if I had to verbally step on them, and of course, those unique things that I bring to the table, just make me a fair offer. Cap it off at the end. I'm sure it'll be fine. By the way, I am sure it'll be fine if they make you a fair offer based on what I just said. Will they make you a fair offer? No, not in almost every case. In almost every case, they tend to lowball. Well, I'll just offer them this. Oh, we can always change it. And behind the scenes, it tends to sound like that. The problem with negotiating in general, and we're not going to cover all negotiating here. That's a whole separate video. The problem with negotiating in general is, is that anytime you negotiate, you could lose. Someone could be insulted by the process and suddenly pick up their toys and go play in a different play yard. So um, there's a whole Ask Self Recruiter all on negotiations. Just look at my YouTube channel and there's much more discussion over there. How to get the very best offer. Don't talk about money. Time to get it right. What are we talking about here? Well, there's two timing issues to think about. If it's a physical in-person meeting, you need to get into that area 30 minutes in advance. Not, not in their lobby, not in their office place, but you know, go to a park bench, go get a coffee, uh, review your notes, uh, center yourself. The last 10, 15 minutes, close your book. Make sure you've got the right caffeine levels, food levels, everything else. Then time it so you can get through the building security and the floor security arrive in their office lobby five to 15 minutes before your meeting. You have an 11 o'clock meeting. You show up at 1035. That is not a good thing. John, your 11 o'clock is here. Oh, oh, my day's already out of control. I can't leave you out there 25 minutes. I have to put on a happy face. I have to come out there and go, oh, hi. Glad to see you. I'll be, I'll be out right at 11 or, or, or just after a little busy today, but I can't wait. Oh, you're already messing up my day. Because you thought it, it shows something positive by wrecking my calendar versus respecting my calendar. Time to get it right. Second timing issue is on accepting that offer. Now, do go and watch that whole self-recruiter, ask self-recruiter negotiation video over on this uh, YouTube channel. But if, you, if you're not going to negotiate, you need to accept that offer now. Why would you let the orchestra build all the way up to the crescendo, waiting for the cymbals to crash, and then not give them the satisfaction of giving them the yes? You're going to make them wait till tomorrow to get the yes or make them wait till Monday to get the yes? doesn't make sense. If you're going to accept it, accept it now. Give them the win. Keep that nice momentum moving. Pat each other on the back. Go have a great weekend. If you are going to negotiate it, that's a different thing. Watch the negotiation video. Um, but if you're not going to negotiate, you need to accept that as quickly as possible. Next steps, opportunity. Even though you're evaluating the whole thing is this is the best thing I've seen since sliced bread. Within credibility confines, has to make sense. Ask for the job. This is as simple as as you get to the end, they have to hear that you still want it. Well, I'm interviewing. Don't they know I want it? No. Nope. All of us window shop quite a bit. So when I get to the end of the discussion, something as simple as uh, Jack, Jim, Jill, <laughs> I'm very excited. What's, what's our next step? Even if you know the next step is to walk you down the hall to meet Sally. Well, John, I'm going to walk you down to meet Sally next. Oh, absolutely. I'm so excited. They just needed to hear it because after they meet all these candidates, they're going to have a roundtable discussion. They're going to throw those resumes across the table and they're going to go, what do we think? What do we think? And eventually... It's going to get around to you. It's going, I don't know, a little strange, a little strange. It didn't, didn't ask me for anything. It just kind of interviewed. Oh, was very excited. Was very excited about the job. Oh, I'd like to hire that one. Ask, ask, ask for the job. Now, last few things to share with you as we begin to close in on our, our lecture today. Here is your real homework, preparing those answers to the questions you might be asked. You're the expert in your field. Think about if you were the boss, what questions you would ask. How would you figure out whether someone really brought their goods to the table? And then 
In addition to that list of questions that you would create to determine the right person, we're going to add three self-recruiter questions. The first one is, tell me why I should hire you over all others that I see. It's really a throwing down the gauntlet. Now, are they likely to ask you this way? Not very likely, but elements of this answer have to be mixed into my answers to convey absolutely has to be part of my answer. Next question is, tell me why my work life will get easier or better if I hire you. Definitely not very likely to ask you this question, but I certainly need to convey elements of this answer mixed into my other answers. Because if you make my work life easier or better, I am hiring you. Of course, last one you really know. Tell me why it's the best business decision I'll make today if I choose to hire you. Again, not very likely to ask you this question, but you better have elements of this answer mixed into your answers. Practice makes perfect. You cannot be perfect simply by watching this and, oh, I'm ready for tomorrow. You have to practice it and you have to practice out loud. That's key. You have to get comfortable with the body language. You have to get comfortable with the sound and tone. Get with a good coach. I know what if you need some help or get with a good friend and practice until you are blue in the face. In fact, if you give your friend a list of questions, your instructions should be rephrase the questions, take them out of order. Because as the job seeker, you should be learning the concept of the question, not a question asked a very specific way. Follow up for you after can be very, very critical. So let's talk about that. Self-diagnosis is required in, in uh, debriefing for the follow-up. So what we're going to do is we're after the interview, uh, if it's in person, we don't don't go home or don't go back to wherever. We simply go to the nearest park bench, go to the nearest coffee shop, whatever it might be. Do an information dump right down onto the page. Every tangential thing that you are thinking, no matter how fleeting that tangential thought is, there's a purpose, a reason you're thinking of. Capture it now before it's lost. And yes, this part should feel like an interrogation, a cross-examination, a grilling. And that includes the good, the bad, the ugly. What went well? So I can repeat it next time. Every single interview is a chance to sharpen the presentation skills. Recognize what's great that you should repeat. What wasn't so great, I should try something else. Ooh, what was a total disaster? I have to take another tact or plan. Did I avoid something? Did I stick my foot in my mouth? All of those things we have to think about. Most important question you save for last because it's a little demoralizing but you need to get the answer. And that is if they don't move me forward, if they don't move me toward offer, what's the reason? This one does not require thought. This one we're after regurgitation. There's the answer. Oh, because then we can area A. Your gut feeling after a few tries of this will be right almost every time. So, all right, after we can still deal with this. So after our normal thank you, and by the way, a normal thank you, please do not thank them for their time. In fact, don't thank anybody for their time ever again for the rest of our lives. You have to be equal to another person. You cannot be equal to someone if you're thanking them for their time. Thank them for their great insights, for the discussion, for what they shared, not for something meaningless that makes you subservient, equal. After that nice little thank you for the great discussion, the insights, blah, 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 blah. We didn't have a lot of opportunity to discuss area A, where I've worked on projects such as this or that. If you'd like to discuss those, reach out to me at any time. I didn't tell them those were the only two projects. They assumed there were more. I never claimed there were more. This technique actually saved one of my promotions years ago. I was running a pre-press service bureau inside of another larger retail operation. And out of 121 locations, I had the number one location in the country. Therefore, my very large store, which was number four in the country, uh, my country manager, went to be my, my country manager, my store manager went to be country manager of Canada. And so John thought, well, I should, I have the number one department in the whole country. Look at my p &L. I should just rise to the throne and become the general manager. And the danger, of course, this is long before my recruiting background. The danger was I could actually see my competitors, which were running these smaller stores, which really were not competitors, were not skilled the same way I was, even though that's a very arrogant Thing to say and see, but you know, I had a lot of roles by that time and uh, a lot of background. I could see they were no threat on a normal competing plane. 
So I went in, I did as well as I could. I'm pretty good in conversation. And, and of course, but there were two deciders, my regional manager who really knew me and my performance and the other region who really didn't know me. Uh, I mean, I worked for the other region like for four months, like four years prior before changing divisions. And, you know, that regional manager was really looking for friends to go out drinking afterward, which is not why I was there. So a little oil and water and I changed divisions. So he didn't quite get John. Do you get my PL? It's amazing, <laughs> which is what you're hiring me for, not for drinking buddies. Um, so in that case, I, I did as well as I can, could. I went back to my retail store. I called my spy. Great to have a spy in headquarters. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I think it went pretty well. I said, no, I don't think so. They're in there arguing about you right now, something about your vision for the store. I'm like, oh, how can I go through the whole interview and I didn't convey my vision for the store? <laughs> So it's such a junior mistake. And so I fired off a great email, thanking them for the insights and the discussion. Everything is, by the way, <laughs> we didn't get a lot of opportunity to, to talk about my vision for the store. If you'd like to discuss that, reach out at any time. Click send. Oh, my gosh. Bullet pointed out. They're going to call me any moment. Never called me. Got the job. Oh, look, he has a vision. He has a vision. Well, he can't change anything anyway. This can solve your problems in advance. In the end, leave them excited. Wow, I'm excited by how I can contribute to the team. What's the next step? It's a date all about them. Remember, as you go through this whole process, all things being equal, it's always about chemistry. So think about how you're going to build more chemistry than the next person. Eye contact, smiling, engagement. Find out about them in advance. Uh, be genuine. Be real. Care about their concerns. And think about all that. Last few minutes today, we're going to take you through all the ways to optimize your video performance because there's a lot of video interviewing these days. Um, it's not as difficult as you think. Just make sure that don't get caught in an unscheduled interview. Even if you happen to answer the phone, it's like, oh, I'd love to talk about that, you know, but I'm just going into a meeting with my tuna fish sandwich. Uh, I'd love to schedule that and reschedule it. So almost everything's going to really be a video conference these days, at least to begin the process because of, yes, COVID-19 and all that kind of stuff. Let's teach you really how we maximize a chemistry confidence issue when we're doing it by distance and, and, and Zoom or Meet or any of the platforms. So here's a few Zoom screens that I pulled right off the internet. I think someone was collecting these over on Pinterest. So each of these, uh, we're looking for chemistry, we're looking for confidence. Do we see it? Do we see it? I don't really see it here. Terrible lighting. Uh, this person's not going to be working for a sports team. I'm not quite sure why they're, they're dressed this way. doesn't really help or convey anything. Do they even really know it's a job interview? So that doesn't really help us. Uh, chemistry and confidence win the day. Do win the day. Do we see it? Do we see it? I, you know, I, I, I don't really see either one here. Um, I don't really see much of anything here. I, I see the sky behind you. Uh, and I see you hunkered down like this, but that doesn't really instill anything positive. So I need to see you. I need to not see the sky, get those distractions out of the way. Uh, chemistry and confidence win the race, win the race. Do we see it? Do we see it? Um, you know, I, I I don't really see it here. I'm sure the person thinks they have chemistry and probably thinks they have confidence, but, but I'm not feeling either one here. All I'm really seeing is the, the beams on your ceiling and looking up your nose, which is, I, I don't really need to see up, up your ceiling or up your nose. That's not really what we're after here, um, even though I may flare upward sometimes. <laughs> Okay. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it? Um, chemistry, I'm not really feeling it. Confidence, you know what? Confident gaze. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give the confidence. I'll give the confidence uh, um, exactly right before I take it away. Because I suspect this person doesn't actually have confidence for two reasons. First is the image they chose behind. Yeah. What's wrong with that image, John? Nothing. Except that it upstages the individual. The image is more interesting and alluring, drawing my eyes out to the horizon away from the individual. So that undermines confidence in the individual. Plus that gigantic boom mic, a little Madonna boom mic or gamer boom mic type thing. Yes, you may like listening to it with headphones. You may like it with the mic right there, but that undermines confidence in you. That doesn't help us. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it? Do we see it? You know what? I feel the chemistry. I feel the confidence. A little stern, but I still feel it. I'll take it. I'll take it. But what's wrong here? I, even though I like the framing of the room, 
gives the focus to the individual. They've upstaged themselves with this giant square image right behind their head that we are continually going to try to figure out what is that image just behind your head. So let's not upstage ourselves from bad setup. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it? Do we see it? You know, I, I feel both of them here. I'm going to give it to them, but they have the same kind of issue. The same, the same attention to detail where they allow themselves to be upstaged on this curved wall of images, which not only cause reflection, it really causes me to want to zoom in to go, what is in that picture? And again, I'm not looking at you. You are the focal point. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it? Do we see it? I, I, I feel the chemistry. I feel the confidence. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give all those things, but uh, please don't wear giant Princess Leia uh, <laughs> earphones, headphones, earbuds that, that, that undermines. I can hear so much better. I bet you can, but it undermines the confidence in you. Not, not a good thing. Chemistry and confidence win the race. Do we see it? Do we see it? I'll give them both votes. Uh, let's comment in both on the image. By the way, I like this image. It's just a stock image. Sorry for a tissue. Just a stock image, but they chose one where there's depth happening. Nothing in the image disrupts the focus on them. It actually adds focus to them. So all good things there. But I'd say even those medium headphones are a distraction. Just I know you like the headphones. Just get rid of the headphones or switch them over to earbuds that may disappear in your ears. Chemistry and confidence wins the race. This is the clear winner among the images that we've chosen here. Still some problems. It's a little bit up. It's a little bit up. I wish it were a little more level. Uh, but the way it's framed on the left with the architectural features on the window or whatever, a little bit of the picture on the right, just enough of the picture so it frames without being too much distraction. Yes, I wish part of the face on the one side was lit, but all things being equal, this one's the winner. It shows you how much room you have to do in setting up your piece. Now let's take you into my actual setup so you can see how do I produce this and how do you produce something on this level. Now this is my other half's work from home desk. This is butted right up against the front window. Now I have sensitive eyes, Hazel, Hazel. And, and so I've always had difficulty looking into bright light since I was a little kid. And, uh, and so I'm not so excited to sit at the window staring at the bright light, although it looks fabulous on camera. So that's a basic setup that will help. You need great light if you're going to look great, but very likely you need to elevate everything. So even in that case, we needed to take a box and elevate the computer to get the camera up to eye level. This is not about looking down on your camera. This is about getting the camera so it's equal to your eyes, you know, so that you can be comfortable and you can engage. Very likely, you even though there's all this light, you might still need a light ring. Now, most of those light rings have color adjustment buttons on them to go a little bluish, a little yellowish, whatever it needs to make up for so you look natural and normal. All of that is probably necessary to look great. If you'd like to sound great, and this is exactly what I'm speaking on right now, is this blue snowball that you see here. It's called blue, even though it's white, <laughs> but you see it's a blue snowball. This is a condenser mic. They are not very expensive. And you sound much better than the built-in mics on the laptops. Yes, I know the built-in mics on the laptops are pretty good these days. You very likely need one of these to sound good. Also, something you probably haven't thought of is you need to be standing versus sitting. I am standing. It's there. I'm jumping. I'm standing. That frees up my diaphragm with giant muscle that controls all the airflow across the middle of my body, allows me to relax my throat, deepen the resonance, make a better connection standing up. Yes. Now to look great, we probably need light and more height. So this is, I'm really standing in a different place. I've now built two studios in my house or in my apartment. I have one in the master bedroom where I did all of last year's lectures from. Now I've moved out to a front alcove that I fully painted out green screen. So I have, you know, a little more 3d studio out here, but I'm standing in front of the same thing. I'm standing in front of my ironing board. Those are the exact boxes I'm staring at. One of them is full of my books. The others are all empty. And now this allows everything to be elevated and placed in the right spot. Also, just like you're going to see here and subsequent ones coming, I have three giant light boxes that surround me. There's my studio from last year, which is still in the main bedroom. 
Uh, now I'm in a larger, full built out alcove studio up in the front part of the apartment. So yes, I'm surrounded on three sides by giant light boxes. You might recall moments ago, I said my eyes were very sensitive. Somehow when you step onto the stage, your brain goes, it's okay for an hour or whatever it might be. So fall in love, even though it's uncomfortable for me with the light, fall in love with that. Last secret here is you must disconnect yourself from the need to look at the laptop. You don't need to see the other person. What you need to do is look up from the laptop to the camera lens and fall in love with the camera lens. And my eyes never come off the camera lens no matter where I move. That way, when the other person is looking at it, I'm looking directly at them. Of course, I have to prepare for all the other things. I have a bar stool sitting right in front of the ironing board where I can put things like this, or I can put things like this, or, or gosh, I, I, I even have little, you know, sound devices like this to control some sound effects, that kind of stuff. All that kind of stuff needs its own place, which brings me to a point of telling you or sharing with you that I'm standing in about a one foot square of space, which has not moved for the last a little over 60 minutes, top of my body moves, the feet may move just uh, half an inch either way. I stay within the planes of existence and very comfortable everything within space. That's how you need to really control your presentation. So learn to love everything, look into the camera and begin to own it. That brings us to today's interview intervention and we'll be back on Monday for a very special recap. Monday will be the Ask Self Recruiter live q a i think there's a screen coming up oh here it's right here screen coming up for that send your questions in send your questions yes monday is halloween a special 11 a.m session so send your questions in to ask at selfrecruiter.com that's ask at selfrecruiter.com and we'll see you on monday i hope you guys have a great weekend bye take care